right, you've made it. It's the final video in this descriptive statistics series. If you've missed any of the others, I've put them all up on zstatistics.com, but this one is absolutely going to be my favorite. We're looking at standard error, otherwise known as the standard error of the sample mean, which is quite a mouthful. Now, it's not typically associated uh, with descriptive statistics necessarily, but Microsoft Excel actually includes it in its descriptive stats package. And it also acts as a really great bridge between these basic descriptive measures and more advanced statistics. Okay, so this is the standard error of the sample mean. Now, as per usual, I'm gonna go through the definition and the basics of it. And then I'm going to do some advanced topics here where we'll look at confidence intervals. We'll also look at the standard error of the sample proportion and see how calculations differ there. And then I'll offer you a challenge question which will hopefully stoke a little bit of discussion in the comments. But let's first check out what standard error of the sample mean is all about. Now, as I said in the intro, this is a descriptive statistics output that you might get from Microsoft Excel. And if you've watched this series, lots of these terms will be familiar to you. But I'll always get asked the question, what the hell is this standard error thing in here? Is that standard deviation? Well, obviously it's not because here's standard deviation down here. So what is standard error and how does it differ from standard deviation? Well, what we're gonna find out is that while all of these measures here relate to the data set or the sample in question, the standard error kind of only relates to the sample mean. It's in fact the standard error of the sample mean itself. So here's the formula. Now don't get too excited. It's SE, the standard error of X bar, meaning the sample mean. And it's calculated as S on root N. So it's actually calculated from two of these other measures. There's the standard deviation, which is provided here as 73.097. And N can be found as the count at the bottom of this table, which is 11. And so it's easily calculatable. And we can find that it's 22.03 or 22.0397, blah, 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 blah. So we can calculate it, but what is it? And why on earth do we divide by the square root of N? Well, let's see if I can develop your intuition as to what this is about. Let's just say you want to know the average IQ of statistics students. So let's say you make five students sit an IQ test. That's a small sample, right? So here are those five students and their IQs. The highest IQ was 127, the lowest was 94. So of course we can take an average of these five numbers and we get 112.0. Easy so far. Now I might ask you the question, how confident are you about that estimate of the mean? Now, of course, this X bar is an estimate of mu, the population mean. So in other words, this is our best guess as to the true average IQ of statistics students. But because we only have a small sample, surely we can't be that confident about this value, right? Maybe the true mean is somewhere around 105, or maybe it's up near 120. But we can't be too confident about this because we have such a small sample. Now let's extend the study by making 50 students sit an IQ test. So instead of having five students, we now have 50 students. And let's just say we've got their average, which is 115.3. Again, Elise is gonna ask us, how confident are you about this estimate? Well, because we have more students in the sample, we'd be more confident that this reflects the true population mean, right? There should be less variation around this figure. So we're starting to get a bit more confident. And then we can take it to the extreme and say, well, look, if we sampled 500 students and got them to sit an IQ test and say, this is our mean, 114.7. Now, how confident are you? Well, you're very bloody confident at this stage, right? So the higher the number of observations you have, the more confident you are in your sample mean. So the standard error is actually a measure of this uncertainty 
in the sample mean. And it has that formula. So the higher the standard error, the more uncertainty and hence the less confident we are of the whereabouts of the true population mean. And have a look at this little fellow in the denominator of this equation, the square root of n. What happens as n increases? Well, of course, the standard error is going to decrease. So that's where that effect comes in. The higher the number of observations, the lower the standard error, and thus the higher your confidence. So here's that sample again. Now, we've dealt with standard deviation in this series. So to find the standard deviation of this data set, I'll take that as red and we find it's to be 12.72. Now the standard error of X bar is just gonna be S on root N. So that's gonna become 5.69. So we've got now some measure of the uncertainty around our sample mean. And don't forget that sample mean was 112. So if we were to repeat that for the other two samples we took, we can see that we have slightly different sample means in each of these, because of course we have different samples, right? But clearly the standard error of the sample mean is decreasing as the number of observations increases. Okay, so that's it. That is the definition of the standard error of the sample mean. And you can see how it relates to the sample mean itself. It doesn't so much generally relate to the data set in question, it relates to the sample mean specifically. So let's have a look at confidence intervals now because at the moment, all we have are these figures and we don't really know what to do with them. So let's find out what we can do with these standard errors of the sample mean. So let's reconsider the sample of size five again. So here we go. The sample mean happened to be 112. Now, as I said before, we know that the true population mean could be a little bit less than that, could be a little bit greater than that. So with that, we could hopefully construct what's called an interval within which we would hope the population mean lies. So our sample mean is gonna be the middle of this interval. We're gonna take a few little steps to the left and a few little steps to the right and hopefully come up with an interval where we might say we have 95% confidence that the true population mean, that's mu, exists inside it. So how are we gonna do that? Well, first we need to recognize that while it's all well and good to say that mu, our population mean, could be anywhere in this interval, it's probably more likely to be very close to X bar. So there's gonna be some kind of probability distribution associated with this interval. In other words, the population mean is more likely to be closer to X bar than it is to be further away from X bar. So it's not as if there's an equal chance of mu existing at every point within this interval. So we need to take account of this probability distribution. And hopefully, once we do that, we'll be able to set up a region here within which 95% of the distribution exists. And it would be between these two yellow bars, these two points here, that we can find our 95% confidence interval. So part and parcel of this confidence interval is a consideration of this probability distribution. Now the question is, what distribution is this? Well, it happens to be something called a T distribution. Now for the sticklers out there, you'd be telling me that to use a T distribution, you have to rely on a particular assumption. And yes, that assumption is that the population is normally distributed. But fortunately for us, IQ is developed such that it's meant to be perfectly normally distributed. So that should be fine for us here. And usually you'd find that's okay to assume. So this distribution is gonna be a T distribution. So then, to find a confidence interval, we take the sample mean, which is going to be 112.0, remember that from the last slide, and we're gonna add and subtract from that value the standard error that we calculated, the standard error of the sample mean, times the appropriate point on the T distribution where we might find 95% in this central region. Now here's the tricky bit, and I can appreciate this might fool some people. But if there's 
in the center of this distribution, how much of the distribution is in each of the two tails? 2.5%, right? So if you're trying to find the point on the T distribution that this yellow bar represents, it's the point below which lies 97.5%. Okay, that's a bit of a tricky thing. But once you've made sense of that conceptually, all you need to do is type it into Excel equals T dot INV, which will essentially provide you with a point on the T distribution given a probability. So I'll put in 0.975 with four degrees of freedom, N minus one degrees of freedom here. Now your university might ask you to use T tables. I don't really use them that much here on Z Statistics because to be honest, they're completely antiquated. The most basic of software can now make these calculations. And if you put it into Excel, it'll resolve to 2.78. And if we then put that into our calculations, there's 112, there's our sample mean, there's the standard error, times 2.78. And bingo, we have our two limits, 127.8, that's when you add the, that product, and 96.2, that's when you subtract that product. So what we can say now is that we're 95% confident that the true mean lies within 96.2 and 127.8. Now again, the sticklers amongst you would tell me that this isn't quite the correct interpretation of a confidence interval and I respect you if you are thinking that. For the purpose of this video I'm going to leave it like this but on a technicality some people like to say 95% of similar intervals would contain the population mean and that's technically more correct but I'd prefer not to open that can of worms in this video. This interpretation for all practical purposes is fine. Okay, so let's go back to that table we created and let's put in an extra column where we've got the confidence intervals. So here's that confidence interval we just created for where n was 5. And you can see those confidence intervals really coming in sharply when n is 50. A lot narrower, that confidence interval, and even narrower still when we have 500 observations. It is curious though that the difference between 5 and 50 is much greater than between 50 and 500. That's just an interesting observation. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's talk about proportions now because that's the other side of this discussion. And I've prepared a little question for us to deal with proportions. Let's just say 100 voters were sampled and 65 said they were voting for a major party. If I asked you now to find the standard error of the sample proportion, not standard error of the sample mean, but standard error of the sample proportion, of major party voters and also find a 95% confidence interval. Well, the sample statistic is pretty easy, right? 65 out of 100 said they were voting for a major party. Cool, lowercase p is 0.65. Just keeping in mind that some textbooks and sources will use p hat here as opposed to just p. I've tended to use p for the sample proportion. So I'm gonna stick with that. Now, unlike when it was numerical data, this is categorical data, so the standard error of the population proportion is given by this formula here, where it's p times one minus p, all divided by n. And we take the square root because it's the standard error, not a variance. Now, it works in very much the same way, and you'll see there's still this square root of n on the bottom here, right? So as n increases, the standard error is gonna decrease again. And it's fairly easy to sub in the values we got from our question, 0 0.65, 0 0.35 divided by 100, and we get the standard error of the sample proportion is 0 0.0477. So what do we do with that? That's a good thing to get, but can we create a confidence interval and make this somewhat useful for us? Well, of course we can. To find the 95% confidence interval for the sample proportion, very similar, we add and subtract the standard error of the proportion, and instead of multiplying by the appropriate T statistic here, we actually multiply by the Z statistic. 
which is where this channel gets its name. Now, this is just a standard normal distribution. So why on earth, when we have a population proportion, how can we say that this is distributed as a normal bell curve? What about this makes it a normal distribution when we look at the sample proportion? Well, I'll put a link up to a video I've done on the binomial distribution, but advanced players among you would tell me that it's to do with this thing called the central limit theorem. And all that means is that when n gets pretty large, and here n is pretty large, it's 100, all distributions converge to a normal distribution. It's pretty magical. So even though there's nothing in this question that signifies it came from a normal distribution, in fact, it came from just categorical data, yeses and nos. The sample proportion is normally distributed when the sample is large enough, it approaches normality. So instead of using equals t dot inv, I'm now using equals norm dot s dot inv in Excel, which is the standard normal distribution. Simply a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. So p is 0.65, you sub in everything there. Turns out if you put that into Excel, you'll get 1.96. And voila, you'll get 0 0.557 and 0 0.743 as your two limits here. So if you add this product to 0.65, you get 0.743. And if you subtract it, you'll get 0.557. So here we can say we're 95% confident that between 55.7 and 74.3% of voters will vote for major parties. Now that's actually quite wide. It seems quite wide, and I'm always surprised when I deal with proportions, how wide the confidence intervals are, particularly when we have something like 100 voters. But if you think about it, each observation is just a one or a zero, right? It's not giving us as much information as when we have numerical data. Anyway, again, that's just my own little observation. But let's now go through to the challenge question. Now, this one's pretty tough. I like to keep them tough because... If I made it easy, someone would answer it straight away and that'd be the end of it. But in this question I ask, well, I take a sample of 20 measurements, noting down its sample mean and standard error. Now let's say I wish to halve that standard error. How many more measurements am I likely to require? And I'm keen to see the discussion on this question because it might not be straightforward. Anyway, that is it, team. Congratulations. You've got through the whole series. And as I said right at the beginning, this really does lead on to further studies of statistics. And I might suggest you looking at my next video I've done on sampling. So I'll put that link up in the description and hopefully it pops up here as well. But my name's Justin Seltzer from zstatistics.com. If you like what I do, let me know about it. Subscribe to the channel and leave me a little comment. It's been fun. You are the leader, but the star.